Okay, good morning, everybody. I think we're live here. You have a little, little says, clock says is going live. up. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension here in Hernando County. And I'm here with my regular co-host, Lily Browning. I'm from, right here. She is our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Program Coordinator. Woohoo! You got it right. <laughs> And she is coming to us from the Hernando County Utilities Department offices because she works with Florida Friendly Landscaping and water. And I, I work with water also. We all work with water mm -hmm. in one way or another. So, In my little private uh, conference room that I'm normally in, um, nor any of the other private rooms, <laughs> have functioning internet. So here I am out in Cube City, but this is where I normally sit. So <laughs> if you see people or hear people, that, that's the way it is. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Um, <clears throat> as you may be able to tell, I'm back at the office today. Yay. So broadcasting live from the official office. And Lee, good morning. Or How maybe are you? you took a picture of your office and it's a green screen. I didn't, but that's a good idea. <laughs> and I need to get one of those green screens that just clips onto the back of your chair. Oh, cool. Yeah. But I don't know what kind of background I'd pick. I'd, I'd pick something creative. Well, and just so you, if anyone thought that um, I've always had a green screen behind me, you can see <laughs> I moved it. It's not, it's real. <laughs> so. Old school. This, this background isn't too bad. You can see the stack of papers on top of the filing yeah, cabinet. Yes. I need to file. Well, what this is that. really doing is hiding my messy desk. So <laughs> there you go. That's what green screens are good for, anyway. So, mm -hmm. hey guys, if anybody has any lawn and garden or tree or water kind of questions, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat, and we will do our very best to answer them. When will you have yesterday's class on Facebook? I know you had the Zoom link, um, but when you download it to Facebook, it's, I know Lee was there. Um, it was a great class. Mm -hmm. I, I sent would. it to John. As okay. soon as I got it, I sent it to John and he emailed me right back. Thank you. And he get on it, but I haven't gotten the fin. I'll probably get the finished product and finished YouTube link back today. Okay. Well, you can download it um, right from zoom on to facebook as well and then later put the youtube thing that's what i usually do i could <laughs> but then you have yeah. to sit there while it spins and downloads oh, okay and it's time consuming <laughs> does i usually go do something else but... and john puts in the nice intro slide he does he does and music and everything yes. john cancello is with hernando county public information he's very talented and he is the talent behind yeah, a lot of what we do. Yes, and he's he does not, a great and, job, great to work with. And, and if he does yeah. it, I don't have to. Right. And right now, um, they are short staffed. And because um, they don't have a public information officer at the moment, she went on to bigger and better things. Mm -hmm. And while they're looking for another one, John is doing a lot of juggling. So he he's doing a great job. I sent him another video the other day, and gosh, by the end of the day, he was done with it and sent a link back. Mm -hmm. I think that you already shared that one. Oh, the yes. Arbor Day one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was a very good class we did yesterday, which was um, Diagnosing Plant Problems, Part 1. You did very well. It, it did remind me a lot of Master Gardener training, so I think... Um, you gave everyone a, a little bit of taste of what the master gardeners learn. Some of the information, some of the slides was from master gardener training. Mm -hmm. And because you know, it's, it's a we, complicated topic. And I always need to be reminded the difference between a sign and a symptom. And you really did help with that. A sign is you're looking at the issue, you know, like a conch, you are looking at the organism. It's a Almost. physical part of the organism. Right. And, a and we usually have to use a microscope to be able to see that. But like a conch or a mushroom, anybody can see one of those. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, pretty visible. 
And a symptom is what happens to you or to the plant because of <laughs> the disease or the, um, the anomaly anyway, you know. The and pathogen. Also, the pathogen. The attacker. Yes. The issue. And the difference a lot between of ways you look at it. biotic and abiotic. Abiotic are things that are happening outside of the plant that affect it. Cold mm -hmm. weather, you know, too much water. Generally non-living. And if it's something that's alive, like a fungus or a bacteria, then it's a biotic. It's from inside of the plant. Yeah, it got there somehow, usually by an insect or something. Or it had an open wound and it the wind mm -hmm. blew it there. Yeah. But there's always an exception because viruses are technically not alive. Not alive. Yeah. So are I they biotic? Are they abiotic? They're just they're just unusual and they're there. Yeah. So you don't you don't want to overthink these things too much. Just realize that there's a lot of things out there that can do things to your plants. And we just really want to try to steer people away from assuming it's an insect, assuming oh, yeah. it's a lack of water, assuming that it's a fertilizer issue, and just throwing spaghetti against the wall and hoping for the best. And what I learned, and I know there's exceptions to everything, is usually if the spots are like perfectly round and haloed, that's probably a fungus. If they are oddly shaped, that could be a bacteria. And I guess if it's really, really bad, you can put it in water and watch the, like, it ooze, and then it's a bacteria. Yes, and that's caused the, the easiest way to show that is if you have a tomato plant with bacterial wilt, because the bacteria will fill up the stem. And if you cut the stem and put it in a glass of water, you'll see the bacteria. It's like a film or mm -hmm. ooze mm -hmm. that starts oozing out. What you're looking at is bacteria streaming out. I've never seen a tomato plant with bacterial wilt. It's a common problem for commercial growers because their fields will get infested with it. But from a homeowner point of view, I've never had anybody bring in a plant and it's like, oh, this has bacterial wilt. Never seen it. Really? Hmm. Yep. But you know, you can take a leaf and if it has a bacterial disease, cut a very tiny part of it off, put it under a microscope, add a very tiny drop of water and the drop of water will make the bacteria stream sometimes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I've seen that, but as far as putting a stem in water and seeing it stream the bacteria, I've never seen it in real life, but it, it, it does happen. It's one of those textbook things that you learn in school. Well, yeah, you need to get that available as soon as we can, because it was a great class and you're doing a part two. When are you doing a part two? Yes, we have part two, not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. So, and I'll I pull won't that up on be Facebook. there. And I won't be there for that one. <gasps> yes, I know you won't be around for that. No. Because hey, I see us live on Facebook with a little bit of a delay, but I still mm -hmm. we're we're transmitting. I won't be around um, because sometimes crazy people decide that Pennsylvania is the place to go <laughs> at the beginning of February. <laughs> oh, no, no. Bad time of year to go up north. Have a granddaughter down here. She's 13. She's never seen snow. And she's off of school that week. So somewhere, you know, in the midst of summer, I promised her, sure, yeah, I'll take you to <laughs> see snow. Um And we do have relatives up there, and I have a little baby I need to see up there. So it's a good excuse, but... Maybe I'll try to check in, let you guys see some snow. That would be cool. Is it snowing Very cool. up there where you're going? Is oh, my gosh. Right. It may be gone by then, but over this past weekend, they had about 10 inches. Oh, wow. But they think oh, it'll yeah, be that's gone. Right. They, the storm system that came through here caused a lot of snow up there. Yeah. Um, even if there isn't any, um, you know, in the normal places, we can take her to go snow tubing at ski resort. <laughs> there will be snow there one way or another. I say we liberally. I'll let my other daughter, her aunt, um, do that because, yeah, I don't want to be knocked around on a snow tube. 
Yeah, I had the opportunity to go to a um, extension conference this winter that was being that is being held in Kansas City in the middle of February. Kansas City. I could not bring myself to put in an abstract for that one. (laughs) Do I really want to go to Kansas City with airfares the way they are and airports and plane cancellations on a good day and all of them getting canceled when it snows? (laughs) I thought, nope. We're driving. So we're bringing lots of food and blankets. (laughs) So here you can see me screen sharing our upcoming part two of diagnosing plant problems. Part one was recorded and will be saved and shared as a video on Hernando County Government Broadcasting's YouTube and also on Lily's Facebook page and eventually on my Facebook page. But we have part two of that class coming up Wednesday, February 2nd at 10 a.m. You know Uh, where I could be that day? Where could it's you possible. be? I could be in Punxsutawney itself if I wanted to <laughs> on Groundhog Day. <laughs> I won't be that far. <laughs> I'll let you know if I decide that. <laughs> okay. Where I will probably be is on my daughter's couch wrapped up in blankets, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, that'd probably be a lot more comfortable. Yes. So if you like to tune in for part two of Diagnosing Plant Problems, uh, there is the link to click on to register for it in advance, or you could do it the morning of right beforehand. Or if you're not able to join us live in person, we're going to record it and it'll be back out there in a few days. And we'll make all sure over the place, we only multiple have one YouTube, link. multiple Facebooks. Right. There was some confusion with links, which may have been on our end. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I got there, so I didn't get confused. Right, I know, but I think what the newspaper put out was a different link. Oh, yeah, I have no idea what they put out. Originated with, so, but that's the good thing about recording it. If you happen to miss it, we're sorry, but see us. um, If you you want to see it right away, Bill will send you the Zoom link. Watch it on Zoom before it's even available on YouTube. And, of course, the best way to keep on top of all this information is that web address is scrolling along the bottom of your screen. If you just go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, you're going to see a full listing of all of our upcoming classes, and whether they're live or recorded or on Zoom or on Facebook Live. We're going to be doing a lot more on Facebook Live coming up, or we even have things that are now on just YouTube Live. All that information is there. All the links you need are there. So that's the best place to go for the most up-to-date, accurate information. I think we ought to do one. I think we discussed yesterday on how to take good pictures um, of, you know, plants that you think have a problem or, and then also how to bring samples in like lawn samples and things like that. Just little three minute videos even. Well, I'm giving a class this coming Tuesday, um, becoming part of the solution resources for reporting different mysterious critters so extension and florida department of agriculture and fish and wildlife and everybody shares lots of information on invasive animals and tegu lizards and pythons and invasive plants invasive insects and we want the general public to uh, to know more about them so that when you see something, you can say something and report it to us. So I'm going to be giving a class on all the different venues and ways that somebody could report something mysterious. So, Lily, let's say you live out in rural highlands. Let's say you walk outside tomorrow morning and take the dog out and there's a big old four foot lizard in your backyard. Well, Do you then, know who to report that to? Um, you. <laughs> Okay, very good. But I would have to, I couldn't do anything about it other than go, oh my, and and pass the report on to somebody else. But there is a lot of different ways. University of Florida has a service called Distance Diagnostics and Identification Service. Anybody can sign up for that and you can submit pictures of insects and plants and animals. You don't know what they are. And experts at University of Florida will identify them. There is iNaturalist. I know a lot of people are familiar with iNaturalist. 
that's a good way to submit pictures and get things identified. There's something called ED or EDD maps, and that shows the range of different invasive animals, plants. So if you report a new invasive plant here in Hernando County, and it's never been reported before, they add it to the map, and now Hernando County officially has that plant here. Don't you want yeah. to report that to the Division of Plant Industry? Yes, you can also report animals to FWC, mm -hmm. uh, the Fish and Wildlife Commission, or uh, plants, animals, and a variety of other things to Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So I am giving a pr presentation on that this coming Tuesday. I, did I guess not I know need that. to pull that together and think about what I'm going to do. But if you didn't you want, tell me you were doing that. <laughs> if you want, I can redo it, we can record it. Somewhere and we else. can send it to John, let him work his magic, and then we can share that with everybody. So if you want to put that on, the Absolutely. Minutes, that'd be great. Sure. That, I think that's very important. And yeah, if I walked out and saw a three foot lizard, I it might call you and you would know because I would just be screaming. And <laughs> you tell your husband and then you take care of it and then you'll be searching for who can make a good pair of boots out of this probably yes <laughs> and you know i looked online once before to look for tegu lizard boots and i'm pretty sure that they are available oh, monica has a question <laughs> so moving oh, monique, from i'm tegu sorry lizards monique. On Mo monique so monique asks does the extension office do soil samples? It depends yes on no. the extension office. Yes and no. Uh -huh. Some extension offices do soil testing. Mostly what they do, if they offer it, is just pH testing. I know Lake County does. Citrus does, I believe. Citrus does? I'm not really sure. I thought I heard that. You know, at least a I'm certain day. Sure Pasco, Pasco doesn't. So Monique is asking about ours. Mm -hmm. We do not do it here in-house, but we do have the uh, form and bags and all the information for you to send a soil sample off to Gainesville to the University of Florida. They'll do the soil test. They send you the results. They send me the results, and it only costs $10. So it's a bargain. <clears throat> and they test for pH and levels of phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, zinc, and something else can't remember exactly what but they test for a number of different nutrients along with the ph so Why? if you come by our office or give us a call we can give you all that information yeah. to get you set up why don't they test for nitrogen dr lester because there's no point testing for nitrogen in a soil sample because nitrogen comes and goes and changes chemical forms so quickly that if you go in your backyard this afternoon and dig up a soil sample, send it to Gainesville, by the time they get it and test it, the nitrogen in your soil has changed. It's gone either up or down or to a different chemical state. It's going all over the place. So they, they can test for it when they're doing research in a lab. If, they're, if they do something to the soil and they have to know the nitrogen level at this moment, mm -hmm. they can do that. But sending samples and getting it tested, it, it, it doesn't really tell you anything. So they give you nitrogen recommendations based on everything else that's in there. Sure. So if Monique sends a sample off and she says, I'm trying to grow a citrus tree in this soil. They're going to test it. They're going to tell her what the ideal pH for citrus is and what hers is. Is it high? Is it low? Is it just perfect? And they're going to give her a recommendation for how much nitrogen to fertilize her with per year per thousand square feet. So they kind of assume that um, the soil sample has zero nitrogen and how much do you have to provide for a full year? Yep. So and, and don't do not just automatically add lime <laughs> to no, your Florida soil. Guys, please don't do that because so many people move here from up north and they're in the habit of just adding lime every fall. I'm not even sure why. They're not sure why. They just do it. Well, been, because they were told it. they had to sweeten the soil. Yes. It doesn't make soil sweeter or taste any better. 
It still tastes like dirt. Less acidic. Dirt. Less acidic. There, that's the terminology that. That's came bad, on. bad, bad use of um, vocabulary words, basically. <laughs> but if you have, if your soil is either a good pH for whatever you're trying to grow or slightly high, if you lime it first and get it tested second, you may, by liming it, push your pH sky high and now your Bahia lawn is going to die, azaleas are going to die, you can't grow blueberries, a lot of things are going to happen. Even if your pH is high, there's stuff you can grow, it's just you're going to be more limited. So soil test first and then lime if it's recommended second. Have you ever seen it recommended? Sometimes, but not very often. Maybe for a farmer, but not for a lawn or something. It depends. Yeah, if blueberries, maybe, but they would probably just tell you to grow those in pine bark directly. Yeah, soil yeah. tests here in Hernando County, very few people have naturally acidic soil anymore. Most people have neutral to alkaline, new home construction, could have anything. It's a roll of the dice. You can because have that's filtered. high, high, record-breaking pH. Mm -hmm. and, and you're not going to grow your Bahia grass on high pH. Nope. And if you live in Hernando Beach, God didn't make Hernando Beach. We did. And it's mm -hmm. made from dredge. And what is dredge? It's sand and ground-up little seashells. What are seashells made of, Lily? <laughs> Calcium. <Chemistry quiz. laughs> What's in the seashell? Calcium, I assume. Calcium carbonate. Yes. What's in lime? <laughs> Calcium bicarbonate. Calcium yes. carbonate. So people who have lots and lots of dredge or seashells in their soil naturally have very high pH. So when I get a soil test from Hernando Beach, it could be 8.5. Which is and very especially high. if you live like I do on a lime rock road, um, and summer gives you those nice milky streams <laughs> through your yard, sure, you don't need to be impact. adding more. So runoff and limestone road wash off is going to wash onto your property. It's going to change to pH, but also, pHs yeah. here in Hernando tend to be higher and not lower. So what? I rarely see lime recommendations. What is our main industry? Mining. Mining what? <laughs> Mining. Well, they mine phosphate uh -huh. for phosphate fertilizer. So yes. people rarely need to add phosphorus as a fertilizer element. Most people, when you get that soil test, it's going to say that you have very high phosphorus. So you're good on phosphorus generally. And they Corey, also Corey. mine lime here, right? Yes, yes, they do. Or limestone. Limestone. Um, where, well, we use it for roads where I live, but um, it's used for road bed all over the country. And we provide, Central Florida provides a lot of it. The rock mines are hidden by trees and stuff, so you don't know you're circumventing them when you are mm -hmm. driving all over Hernando County, anywhere outside of Spring Hill, basically. But they're there, you know, if you live by them, because you're house gets shook a little bit sometimes <laughs> Dynamite. <laughs> yes um but yeah i'm the point is don't just automatically throw lime because we're good with lime already you may be good with lime and you need to find that out first and then make adjustments second and yes corey you can do your soil test through our office instead of having to go all the way to maybe your home county Pasco's office. Very important. When you get a soil test done and it gets sent off to Gainesville to the University of Florida Soil Testing Lab, they will send the results back to you and they also send the results back to your county's extension office. So when you fill the form out, if you put down your Pasco County address and zip code, they will now send the results to Pasco County. And number one, it will continue they're nice. them because they're thinking, who the heck is Corey? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And they won't But they're very about. nice there. They, they would be fine. Sure. It's just that if you are confused with your results and you call us, I won't have an email copy of your 
soul test report, you can send it to me and then I can read it over and see what's going on. Yeah, yeah he can forward you can it read to it you. to me over the phone. That works. Right. And we can get to the bottom of what your question might be. Or when you get your soul test done, you can tune in here at 10 o'clock Thursday morning and ask us all about it then. And we can talk about it. And that way everybody can learn. But Whitney's not scary to talk to either. But <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, we work a lot with people in Pasco County Extension. Whitney is great to work with. Mm -hmm. I work with her on a lot of different programs. We work on a big water program together because it all comes back to water in one way or another. It does. So Monique is asking about pH because she's looking at weed control and pH. Interesting topic. We were kind of discussing that. I think it. I can't remember we if it was on that, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what, what I we had a class on was different weeds tell you stories about your soil. So yeah. So you got to be really careful. High pH is going to favor certain weeds, and low pH favors certain weeds. So if you know what your pH is, you have an idea of what kind of weeds you're going to be battling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you have to be real careful. I was reading stuff, you know, on those Facebook neighborhood groups. You got to be real careful what they tell you. Um, oh, you have to be careful about everything they tell because you. Because I was reading somewhere, you know, somebody was complaining about sand spurs. And um, I guess they were at the right bus stop, but they got on the wrong bus <laughs> for the answer. They mm -hmm. told her to lime it. That's not... I mean, I've seen sand spurs growing on, you know, very, you know, lime-like soil. And I think what the bus they were looking for is that a, you know, a nutrient-rich um, ground doesn't, you know, sand spurs don't prefer those. That's kind of, you know, where they were going with that. But lime is not going to solve your problem. <laughs> I think there is an issue with sand spurs. They don't prefer higher pH. Well, they're so all over our people might say lime, but if you have a Bahia lawn and you push the pH too high to discourage sand spurs, Bahia grass needs uh, does best in pH of 5.5, which is fairly acidic. So now your lawn has gone down the tubes along with your um sand spurs so you need to be aware of, of all the implications up front so you might have might as well have used roundup because <laughs> you killed both what you wanted as well as yep. what you didn't yep. so i think what the you can, you could, you the route i would it, take till, is be looking till it till it and resod i'd be looking for the, you know um uh top dressing compost Maybe even once a year or so, some mushroom compost or some black cow or something to help boost the nutrients in that soil. And um, the sand spurs aren't as happy with that. Where you see sand spurs growing is in, if you think about it, in some really pretty cruddy soil, you know, just like almost yeah. barren. And you can spot spray with an herbicide. You can use a pre-emergent herbicide pull, if, you, if you hit just the right time. It I can pull work. mine up what i do and I've, I've heard from a number of people they were diligent about pulling it up early in the season and after one two three years they say they have no sand spurs yeah so it is possible mm -hmm. especially near the front some grows up near the front door and i don't recognize it maybe i should until it's got us some sand spurs on it but i just pull it right up from the roots and put them in the trash the trash guys probably don't well they don't they just pick up the <laughs> the thing yeah. so they don't get um poked by them so so cory cory has fairly acidic sand it's candler and tavares fine sand so that still happens it's just most of the soil tests i look at are going to be more um either along the coast or disturbed or improved or just recently built on soils and one thing people have done is um if you have a lot of sand spurs Get an old piece of carpet and attach it to the back of your riding mower and, you know, drive it around. It will pick up quite a bit of them. So. And talking about Pasco County Extension, Corey's a big fan of Frank Galdos. 
Yes. Frank, um, Corey. <laughs> Corey. <laughs> Uh, Frank is no longer with the county extension office. I'm sorry to report that. I'm very upset. Um, but he went, he moved, actually, I'm not too upset because he went to um, Pasco County Utilities, back to the water department where he had worked before. <laughs> yes, I know when Bill um, asked me who I wanted to co-host with me next week because he can't be here. And I said, Frank? <laughs> But not possible. So we're Frank was always in. a great guest to have on. Yes, yes. And Lee has a question about coconut. Why do we get coconut tree questions? <laughs> because you're popular here I am all in Hernando over County. the state. Do you know of any coconut trees here in Hernando County? No. <laughs> I don't know of any either. But fortunately for you, I did take some courses on tropical fruits, and I'm you know I'm uh, familiar with coconut palms. Not the world's experts, but Lee has a coconut tree that produces coconuts with no water. I'm going to have it removed. Do you know why there is no water in the coconuts? You could put lime in I'm the sure coconut. You <laughs> <laughs> Put the lime in the coconut. <laughs> See, it all worked together. Okay. I would say hey, it's dehydrated. Thank you for that question, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's dehydrated. You know, and just in all seriousness, I'm really not sure why a coconut tree would produce coconuts either with water or without water in them. That's more of a um, probably a management issue about exactly how the coconut palm is being cared for day in and day out or possibly the variety of coconut palm keep in mind coconuts are palm trees and we have a little saying about palm trees palm trees do weird palm tree things they do so they, they do all have they little want. quirks and they all tend to do whatever they want to do Palm tree, some palm trees will leave their boots on so when you cut a leaf off that little stump that stays on some palm trees hold their boots forever and ever until they die of old age. Other palm trees will hold on to them for 10 years and all of a sudden, boom, drop them all. Now you have mm -hmm. boots all over your front yard. Yeah. Palm trees kind of do whatever they want. So I'm not sure even if there's much that you could do to make your coconuts have water in them or if there was something that maybe you were doing wrong or missing. It may just kind of fall under a weird palm tree thing. Because they do have little minds of their own, it seems like. Does everybody else have that song in their head now? <laughs> I will for the rest of the day. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so Corey's been able to pull up his sand spurs. I know of a lot of people who have reported success with that. It's one of those things. It takes diligence. And I guess Lee's not going to report us. She did enjoy that last answer. <laughs> But, you know, I got a phone call yesterday that I had to return. I called the lady back. She just bought a few acres in Brooksville and has a ton of, what's the invasive plant that gets the little red berries on it? Coral ardesia. Coral ardesia. She has a ton of coral ardesia on a couple of acres behind where they're building the house. And the service who's re clearing the land, removing the trees she told them, get as many of those plants out as you can. And she was worried about the little berries falling off and sprouting. I said, well, little berries are going to fall off and they're going to sprout. Yeah, so yeah. you have to be diligent. What she's going to do is start just, I said, you can spot spray them with um, triclopyr. That's going to be a very effective herbicide. And just, just don't spray the whole area. Just spot spray she has a backpack sprayer, so that helps save your back. You don't have to bend over and spray. You can stand up and spot spray. I told her, if you're diligent, you will win. But it's going to take a while. And she figured, yeah, it's going to take a year or two or three or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if you're, sure. every time they come up, if you hit them, you'll win eventually. But it's not going to happen overnight. So my, we bought this land beside us and some soil was disturbed 
and my husband had asked me if he saw if I saw this plant growing, which I hadn't. And the way he described it to me, it was night. He said, well, you know, it's just growing in this dirt pile and it has these little balls that look like watermelons. <laughs> so I said, you know, words I'm not going to repeat here because I <laughs> thought that sounded to me like tropical soda apple, the way he described little balls that look like watermelons. And there is mm -hmm. an issue yeah, like that in my neighborhood. But when I went out the next morning, it's not tropical soda apple. It is kind of papery flowers. And I looked it up. I think it's ch many names, but Chinese lantern plant, which yeah. probably is also on an invasive list somewhere, just not up at, you know, near the top like tropical soda apple. Yeah. Well, I would be surprised if you had tropical soda apple. That's more oh, of a. Uh, uh, I know it's more of a pasture thing. Issue. But in my neighborhood, when it was building up quickly, you know, in 06 and all that, and then a bunch of half built houses were abandoned, it somehow found its way into those uh, abandoned yards. I've seen it. So mm -hmm. I thought it found its way, but that's not what it was. It's this Chinese lantern plant, which I have to study more. And chances are, now some of the things that have popped up of their own accord, I'm very happy with. I find out like I have native poinsettia, you know, coming up in my one of my beds. But generally, if it comes up and you didn't put it there and it's growing very, 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 very well, <laughs> you better look and see if it's an invasive, uh, non-native. Yeah, it probably is. And we move them around through filter, yard waste, a lot of ways. Certain things just they make seeds that blow in the wind, like Kogan grass here. Corey asked about Kogan grass, and I wanted to point out that University of Florida has a very, very good publication on this on Kogan grass, how to identify it, what it looks like. It has that mid rib that's kind of off center. Yeah, it flowers and gets little seeds that'll blow all over. Oh, it's but a block from my house. There is a very, very, they did a lot of research and came up with plans for how to not get necessarily eliminate code and grass, but how to control it using it's an integrated pest management approach. So is napalm listed in there? <clears throat> no. If we look here, it has a whole chart about what you do the first year in the summer and second year in the spring, third year, it has an, a whole thing. And it involves cutting it, burning it, spraying it with herbicides, but doing each at the correct time of year so that you're going to have an actual impact. And you will get good control, but notice I say control and not elimination. You're not going to be able to get rid of it 100.00%. The Kogan grass is a block from my house. I keep eyeing it up thinking, when is that, when is the wave going to get over to my. It's, it's, well, you know, you know, just driving through Brooksville, there's areas oh, where yeah. there's just acres of it. Yeah. Um, we got a couple questions coming in here. Is this the time to cut Mandevilla way back? This is in a pot and has a few leaves left at the top, but that's it. Depends on where she is. Is she in South Florida or here? I wouldn't do it here. South Florida may be okay, but here in Central Florida, you want to wait until early to mid-March to prune everything back. That way you're almost definitely safe from the cold weather and you get everything cleaned up, cut back, and all good to go for the rest of the year. Something like roses, you can cut way back now, but things like that, you're going to encourage new growth that will be really susceptible if we have a sudden freeze. And Monique is wondering if triclopyr works well on oxalis bulbs. My guess is yes. Sure. I leave oxalis. Broadleaf. Um, <laughs> triclopyr works very well on broadleaf weeds. It's used a lot in pasture management. So it doesn't kill grass as it kills broadleaf weeds. That's one of the things I leave alone in my freedom lawn. But 
it fixes nitrogen, doesn't it? Isn't it a legume, sort of? <laughs> like, now I guess it's different. It's not really a clover. <laughs> yeah, Corey says that his uh, Kogan grass is kind of shaded out by trees, but as he clears more, it's going to be more aggressive. It can get pretty aggressive. Oh, yes. And let me put a link to this Kogan grass publication in yeah you see it comments. on the sides of the roads where the um you know the the state and everything they try that you can see where it's been burned and treated and then like the whole sides of the roads are brown for a while because they're trying to keep that kogan grass cut back out of the way yeah it's tough polk the county can still up. get pretty cold i think yeah, the Mandavia is in Polk County by Poinciana. Warmer they've than had, here. Warmer than here, but they've had citrus freezes too. So, you know. Sure. And February, a lot of times, is our coldest month, and you're going to get some <laughs> really cold weather. So, yeah, you may and want you're to hold off inland, a bit longer. In inland, it gets colder than the um, coastal areas. Polk mm -hmm. County, it seems like it's always hotter and colder <laughs> than anywhere else. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask and share. I repotted my volunteer um, tomato that my compost <laughs> bin was giving me. So oh, we'll good see, for we'll, you. We'll see how well it does. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm behind on my spring garden. I, I did plant some tomato seeds and they're starting to come up. I need to get really busy on that. You're the vegetable guy. <laughs> that way I'll have a garden where stuff is going on and I can share pictures and little video clips. And I can show you what I did right and what I did wrong. <laughs> yes. Show everybody, okay, when you do this, it, things don't work out really, really well. That happens. It happens. Corey has some fun Smilex. Yes, My and Corey... Corey, I put the link to the um, uh, Kogan grass uh, in the um, chat box. Chat. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly how you're watching this. Here, I have. Give me a second here. My sister calls Smilex um, Devil Vine. <laughs> It is. <laughs> yes. So, Corey, or anybody else who's interested in getting more information about Kogan grass, if you go online to edis.ifis.ufl.edu, if you go just there and put in the search box, you could put in Kogan grass, you could put in Kogan grass control. UF has a lot of different publications on Kogan grass, but the WG. 202 is the one that if you read through it at the bottom has the whole control plan and it shows you what to do in year one i think it's three year plan year one year two and year three during each season burn it cut it spray it whatever it might be and if you follow that that's going to give you the best chance of having a good amount of control I haven't found anything to eat it yet no and they're always looking at those things. Mm -hmm. We do have a thrift for Brazilian pepper, and they should be released here soon. I need to yeah. check on that. Yeah. Uh, Yay. We're going to be part of a um, little research program here. They're going to be released over Hernando uh, Beach. along Hernando Beach in a secret location. I think you know the secret location I'm talking about. I, I do. Okay. I'll keep it a secret. Okay, I'm going to have to invite you and all your bosses to come out there, and we'll have to have a big ribbon cutting and releasing bugs on the Brazilian pepper. And all my bosses, because it may or may not be Hernando County property, <laughs> we're going to release it. No, it is, and your bosses yes. are in control of it. So Yes. So. Well, you know, we can't. 
Um, same thing with the, yeah, the Brazilian pepper. You know, we can't make homeowners get out of their yard, get it out of the yard if we're not doing anything on the public <laughs> lands too, you know, to try and get a hold of it. Now, um, I know there are, there's uh, programs out there. You may not feel like the county's doing anything, but they do the amount they can with the money they're given each year to clear it from the right of ways. So. Yeah, and biological controls or beneficial insects for certain invasive plants help but they're never going to make it go extinct or go completely away. It's just one piece of that integrated pest management toolbox that you can use. So air potato beetles have helped a lot with air potato vines. And I know that anybody who has air potato vines here, at least in central Florida, they make far fewer um, bull bills or the air potato things. Mm -hmm. So that helps. And the air potato beetles help to slow down the spread, knock the vines back. And a lot of people have been able to either reduce the amount of herbicides or eliminate herbicides because they're using the beetles. So it so, helps, but air potato vine is not gone from the entire state of Florida because of the beetles. That's not how No, it and the, who's going to eat themselves out of the only food that they eat to mm -hmm. survive? So, but they've kept it very much more controlled. Susan has a good question. <laughs> Susan wants to know how to best care for newly installed Bahia sod, which was laid on top of builder sand. Okay. And Corey <laughs> comes up with a suggestion of water it. Uh, yeah. Very good. Corey. That is correct. <laughs> Let's talk about that though. <laughs> Thought you were my friend, sure. Corey. You know, I'm with let's, water. Let's, let's start with Lily and the water component. <laughs> yes. Susan, if you live in Hernando County, um, there is a variance to the one day a week watering rules, um, you know, to water in new sod. It sounds like it's a new build, so I'm sure it's enough, you know. You know, it has to be 50% or more of your yard. And... Um, if Bill wants to show my email address, again, you can email me so I can send you, um, you know, how much you're allowed to water. But not only is it what you're allowed to water when you have new sod, it is the best management practice to follow this. It, it needs um, a little bit of water a lot of times. So it's like a graduated schedule. Uh, for 60 days and then you go back to the normal one day a week. <laughs> That's okay, Corey. <laughs> um, um, the thing is what I hear all the time is that they tell me, well, the sod guy said, just water each zone an hour a day, you'll be fine. You and I know nope. that, that there's no way, you know, rootless sod is going to take that up. It's just going to be a waste. It's going to go down the street. It's, you know, and if you are a customer of any water municipality, you know, do you want to give us Wouldn't that, much that make money? for a big bill? You make for, I've seen, I've seen bills over a thousand dollars though. When wow. people have listened to that advice, you don't have to do that. Um, we followed one gentleman who's a friend of extension in a gated community here one of the things he did was put down a compost product before he put down that new sod. Um, but there's, don't worry, because that can still help you. You're in Alachua, okay? You'll have to follow mm -hmm. their rules. But I would still be glad to send you that chart because, it, like I said, it is the best management practice. I'm sure Alachua County has, of course, they have great resources. <laughs> That's where the university is. Um, so, you know, you don't want to have to pay your water company more than you need to. You don't want to waste water. The gentleman that we followed, he put down a compost product first and he followed that schedule precisely. And I watched his water bill and it went up some, 
you know, while he was watering it in, but not more than $40, $50, you know, if that. So you do have to, with the cost of the sod, factor in the cost of watering it in. But th those are the important things we want to, you know, and oh, and the compost product can come in later when it gets a little bit es established. You can actually top dress maybe once a year like a fertilizer, but it's not over your and lawn. That, that'll help to build up the soil because so, Susan says that it was laid on top of builder sand, which is normal in new home construction. Sure. The problem is if you got Bahia sod, it likes a pH of 5.5. I don't know what the pH of that builder sand or fill dirt is. Nothing. And my my <laughs> sense is nothing. you don't know what it is either. <laughs> yeah. And Lily doesn't know what it is. That may be a problem long term. If for some reason the topsoil or sand or fill dirt that they put your Bahia on top of has a very high pH for some reason that will be a problem long term with the Bahia lawn. It's never going to thrive. It's never going to look great. But Susan has the advantage of living um, in a county that is, well, the University of Florida is right there. So you have so many resources um, at hand. But also if you are in like the city of Gainesville or, or in the, you may be further out, but if you're in the city of Gainesville, they also have a very um, proactive water department too. They do. So. They do very much so. Working with people to um, uh, reduce irrigation, reduce the need for irrigation or landscapes. They do have programs that encourage people to put more flower beds and native plants and everything else in their yard within the city of Gainesville. Like I said, I'm not sure. Right, right, right. Out in the, you know, you don't have to go far outside of Gainesville to be out in the country. Right. Country. Yes. So there's a lot of rural Alachua County also. Rural. Beautiful. Rural. I see. Um, you say that word. I can't say it. Rural. 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 And Lori says she sent a question and some pictures to your email about a questionable fungus. Yes, you Not did. Mine. <laughs> yes. And I saw the email and I don't know what it is. So it looks like a not... You know, it may be just a lichen growing on the trunk, but it almost looks like more of a white, fuzzy fungus. So I'm going to pass the picture around to a few people. I'll I'll get back with you. I'll email back about what I find out about that. It's on a um, a native persimmon hmm. in the woods or growing on her property. I saw Lori on Saturday at the nursery when you weren't there. Her schedule has allowed her to start participating again. Good. Mm -hmm. And Susan said she lives in Gainesville. She has irrigation, but would still like to follow the best water practices. Yeah. Yeah. Get a hold of Lily. She'll send you the information that we have. Like I said, you should be able to check with city of Gainesville or your utility department. If you have city water and they can give you, their specific rules mm -hmm. because I know that we've talked with homeowners who said the guys came in and they replaced my lawn and the saw guy went and changed my timer on my irrigation. Oh yeah. There's that too. And yes. he has it running for an hour at a time, five times a day. Why is my water bill a thousand dollars this past month? And he's not exaggerating. I've seen bills that big. It's because you've used a ton of water and new sod right after it gets put down has short roots and the roots are not like spread out into the soil yet. It takes time for the roots to go into the soil and spread and be able to get water from far and wide. So with new sod, it's important that you keep it moist. So you're going to water it lightly, but frequently. After it gets established, you need to manage it the opposite way. You want to water it very deeply, rarely, right. or not as frequently. Once a week for Bahia is fine. And by the time summer comes um, for Susan, mm -hmm. it should be well established and then just let nature take care of watering your Bahia grass. Because it rains in Gainesville and it rains in my yard. Mm -hmm. And I, I never irrigate my lawn, never needs it. No. Yeah. Um, remember um, 
last summer or the summer before you and I, um, I got a call from a lady. She was in her nineties and she, or from her daughter and she didn't understand. She knew why the bill was high when her lawn had been replaced, but um, didn't know why, you know, it never went back to its pre lawn replacement, uh, you know, bill amounts. And I thought, I bet I know what happened. And you and yep. I went out there to her house because she didn't understand her clock. And what happened was it was always just left where the sod guy, you know, put the how much it should water. She never went back to the old schedule or it they put it back to one day a week, but they kept everything running too long is what each zone. Yeah. Was. Yeah. Yeah. She was applying a huge amount of water and she is watering parts of her and yard. We were, yeah. That were, were like just weeds. Small. It was weeds and nothing, you know, why? And it, the, the irony of it is you and I got <clears throat> soaked. We were there in like the beginning of July. <laughs> we got <laughs> soaked out there because it was pouring rain. <laughs> we told her and we talked to her daughter on the phone from her porch and we were like, you know, have your mom turn it off. It does not need to be on at least until September and then revisit this. So <laughs> we've gotten some rain recently <clears throat> and we're supposed to get some this weekend, I think also. And then next week there's a chance. So pretty dry time of year, but. Oh, the cold fronts come in and out with rain. And that's yeah. a really, that's a really nice thing that Florida does. <laughs> Um, because the plants need that moisture before and after a good cold front. So um, it's kind of neat that we tell people, you know, if you're preparing for this cold weather, it's good to water a few days ahead of time or whatever, water the ground and then do so afterwards in case it's uh, gets dehydrated or whatever. But 98% of the time, nature's going to do that for you. Yes, we do have another cold front coming. Yes, we do. We still haven't had well, anything that's caused any plant damage at all that I've seen. No widespread damage. A little bit of frost on my car, but nothing to the plants. I've had ice on the windshield. Yeah, twice. Twice I put the car on, you know, you know, five minutes or so before I left, but. Nothing too major. Mm -hmm. And Corey has tomatoes and peppers going. And he said he left them uncovered. It all comes down to exactly what the temperature is right at that tomato plant. Because mm -hmm. you can turn on the TV and it's one temperature at the airport, which is where they get their temperatures from. Different temperature in your neighborhood, different temperature in the front yard, different one in the backyard. It all yeah. depends on the exact microclimate that we're talking about. And one or two degrees one way or the other makes a lot of difference between damage and no damage. Mm -hmm. Of course, jackfruit seedlings are still alive and they are very tropical. Jackfruit they don't like freezing. Yeah. Well, this Have you tried a jackfruit yet? Didn't this um, come up a while back? Yes, it did. I told you I had some with barbecue sauce on it because it's kind of like pork. That just sounds nasty. <laughs> it wasn't. It was pretty good. You put it on a sandwich. You're just eating the... <laughs> Maybe I should have just had the bread and the barbecue sauce, but I mean, it wasn't bad. <laughs> if I find one, I'm going to get it and try it and shoot a little video of it. Okay. So we need to be cover. I need to be covering more of those things. I haven't tried that one yet. Um, See, I, I when I go and spend time with my son's family, they're vegans, so that's when I get, um, you know, get to experiment and get brave with new things. <laughs> it's not just iceberg lettuce and and crackers. No, no, well, not all the time. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I always made a really, really good vegetarian because I like every kind of vegetable there is, and I mix them up. So I, I would have a very, very wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. I knew other people who it was pretty much 
iceberg lettuce and saltine crackers. Yeah. Oh no, they no, they I'm... try all sorts of things. They're very experimental. So, okay. Hey guys, it looks like it's exactly that time. So if anybody has a quick last minute question, we've been doing really good at staying on time recently, haven't we? I know, I know yes. I have. Well, you usually have a meeting you have to get to, so. Nope, not today. Oh, okay. Not today, tons of paperwork to do. Let me see what yeah. else I have to do today. And I'll be stopping by with those brochures for the Master Gardeners, they told me at the nursery that they don't have anything with my contact info. So I'm going to rectify that. Yeah. Otherwise I'm not sure who they're going to send the really hard questions to. I hope right. they don't send them to me. <laughs> so they need to send them to you. Cindy, thank you so much for tuning in. And mm -hmm. Warren, thank you so much. Um, probably a little colder up there today than it is here it's been it's been i think it's been pretty chilly here in the last few days but it's nice but if it's below 65 it's cold when i get back from my journey to the great white north um one thing i'll have to look forward to is by the time i get back it should be getting to be about spring here <laughs> so that would be nice yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, and it's a very <clears throat> nice time of year. Lots and lots of outdoor opportunities, fairs, festivals. I think starting really soon for the next few months until it gets hot in summer, every weekend there's going to be multiple things that people can go and do. Hey, there's so. a festival that I might go to up there. Aside from the um, Groundhog Day one, I have heard in a convention center, so it'll be warm inside. There is a wine, shine, and pierogi fest. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, just my, I guess that's how they stay warm. <laughs> so what wine does pair best with pierogi? Do I know? don't know. I guess I'll have to come back and report that. You'll have to show. <laughs> so, so along with always touching on poop, <laughs> and food recipes. Now we're going to have drink recommendations also on here. So see, we're expanding, expanding our offering. Find what kind of wine pairs with pierogi <laughs> and moonshine. <laughs> yes. What should we do with those um, plum trees that we got when we attended the class? Plant them now. Now is a fine time of year to plant any kind of hardwood trees. But they're little. Period. They're little. They're fine. <laughs> okay. And they're, if you start when they're little and put them in the ground, they're going to root much better long term. Sometimes people think, well, if I get a big tree in a pot, it's going to get big and mature and make plums or whatever you want to make quicker. Not usually because big trees take longer to root and get settled in. It's harder for them. Little trees root faster, and it's a lot easier for them to get settled in and all set. And then they'll send out leaves in the spring. They might flower. They might be big enough to flower. I don't know. Mulberry question. And prune mulberries now or in March is pushing growth already. It's a hardwood. Probably okay. To it's a hardwood. It should be okay. I know with most fruiting trees or plants, you really want to prune them before they start pushing a whole lot of foliage. So for example, peaches, plums, and nectarines, crepe myrtles, a lot of things you want to prune right as they're starting new spring growth or just ideally before. So mulberries should be fine now. Mulberries aren't extremely frost sensitive or fussy. Oh no. Yeah. You can grow those up north. So. Yeah, yeah, all depending on the, the type and variety of mulberry. Mm -hmm. I know that they grew just fine in Maryland. We would throw them at each other and they would make purple stains on your shirt. I think I told you my mulberry story from when I was about eight. We didn't I have think one. I heard the, that. Yeah, the, the, we didn't have one. The neighbors did. It's mm -hmm. branch, branch, you know, it was over in our yard. And um, apparently I ate a lot. <laughs> And in the middle of the night, there was a rush to the hospital because my mother and sister thought I was vomiting blood. 
<laughs> Turns oh, out yeah, it yeah, was yeah. an overabundance of mulberries. Okay. <laughs> My wife to this day hates coconut because when she was little, she ate a whole bag of shredded coconut and things didn't turn out well. So I, I think everybody has something that, that they did that when they were a kid and probably to this day they can't eat. Oh, I, I can eat the mulberries. But... Me? I don't have any problems with any. I'm good. I'm good with all of it. So. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. Before we go showing poor time management here, let's go ahead and wrap this up for this week. Hopefully we will see all, all of you back here again next Thursday. <laughs> and Lily will be in charge next week, and she's going to have a special guest with her. Not positive who it is yet, but she'll have somebody here with her. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if my wife would enjoy coconut with lime <laughs> more. I guess that means that she doesn't like pina coladas either. So coconut's an yeah. integral part of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, we'll be back again next week with more drink recipes and cook <laughs> recipes and tales of insect frass and poop and everything else everything else we cover i mean we mentioned black cow and that was the closest we came to any poop today so i'm pretty proud of us <laughs> yeah we did stay on track pretty well this week yes. i guess so. <laughs> but thanks again everybody and we will see all of you again next thursday morning at 10 a.m until then take care see you then all right thank you